It's the time of the year, as I mentioned on a previous live show, where we rank things, we list things, we tier things right around now in college football. And this is a great exercise for us to do together. There's a lot of power rankings, and I think those are phenomenal. There's a lot of predictions for next season. I think those are phenomenal. I want us to fall somewhere in the middle of that and give you our projection rankings for the SEC over the course of the next three seasons. The question here is, and I put it on my Twitter page, at J.D. Pakel, who do you project to be the top five teams in the SEC, this is important now, over the course of the next three years? So not your 2024 champion, not who you think is going to win the college football playoff next year, just within the SEC, who are going to be the top five teams over the course of the next three seasons within that conference. We'll talk about it right now. Hey, make sure you're subscribed, by the way. If you're watching this in a one-off video, we, we appreciate you watching the show, one, but make sure you're watching this show when it's live on the air. A lot of fun. We get to talk in the live chat. You get to see Nick Brake's beautiful face. It's important for y'all to be dialed in. Uh, best way to be dialed in is making sure you're subscribed to the show. So we appreciate you for that. So my factors in putting this list together, my top five, you can kind of have your own factors. Again, that question I think is probably just the best headline to put this together. But my factors when piecing together my top when piecing together my top five were leadership, essentially who your head coach is and the stability of your leadership, the base of your roster slash your ability to acquire talent, so what you have currently in house, and then your ability to go out and recruit the portal and the high school level. Also, this is important for me: commitment to ball. Commitment to ball from like the, the NIL level, from the administrative level. The best way to say that is your head coach getting a lot of yeses during the calendar year. He goes and asks for more money for your facilities. Yes. He goes and asks your collective for more money to sign this player or to, to keep players on their roster. Yes. That's the, the lens that I think we should view this through. So let's get right to it. At number five, I got the Alabama Crimson Tide. And for Kalen DeBoer, I think it's extremely fair for us to say that he is an elite coach. He's an elite coach. There's no way around it. I think it's also fair to say, I don't know what he's going to be in the SEC. And so when it comes to long term for him, I don't think there's any doubt about the level of commitment from Alabama for him. My question is, can they do this over a sustained period of time to acquire the top talent in the battleground that is SEC recruiting? All right, because I know you can do more with less. I've seen that multiple times. That's a huge selling point for me and why I thought Kalen DeBoer was great for Alabama. But long term, can you do more with more? Because that's what you, I think, will have to do to win in the SEC. Now, I also think this is important to say. We may not know what Kalen DeBoer is as a head coach at Alabama within the SEC until after this three-year period. Because Nick Saban, we, we've said this many times, he's left the covered stocks in Tuscaloosa. The portal did what the portal does whenever you have a head coaching change, but there's still a lot of talent in Tuscaloosa. Unproven, sure, a lot of talent. It's kind of like when you go to someone's house for a potluck. Like, they may have only made one or two dishes, but you eat good because there was a lot of other meals that were brought there and put on the table. So what I'm trying to say here is we may not know what kind of cook Kalen DeBoer is in the SEC until some of that food from the table is gone. But for right now, I think it's very fair to put Alabama at five just because we're kind of in wait and see mode about Kalen DeBoer as an SEC head coach. No questions about him as a head coach. I want to make sure we say that. No questions about him as a head coach. But when it comes to being a recruiter, which is required in the SEC for success, I'm a little bit more wait and see about Alabama. Now, this time next year, we might have a different feel on this. We might have a little bit more of a evolved take on Kalen DeBoer. But for right now, I think five is fair for where they're at. Now, at number four, I got Ole Miss. And the argument that I would take pushing back against Ole Miss is, well, hey, we'll see what happens with Lane Kiffin. He's always floated around with big jobs. I understand that. Who's to say it's not just his agent doing a good job for him because the Auburn job was available? I don't know if he got offered the job or not, but he's still at Ole Miss. The Alabama job became available. Again, I don't know if he was offered the job or not. He's still at, at Ole Miss. So it is what it is. Two 10-win seasons over the course of the last three years, so I got a track record for me to trust a little bit here for Lane Kiffin in Oxford. Here's what I love about Ole Miss, and here's what I love about Lane Kiffin. They have embraced everything that has to do with modern college football. NIL, they're winning in that space. Transfer portal, they're winning in that space. Modern offense, Matt Corral's there, Jackson Dart's there, continue to win in that space, continue to have what they need to be successful and score a lot of points. And now... They're building on the line of scrimmage through the transfer portal. Walter Nolan, Princely Uman Mielin. They're understanding now we can up our level of play with the big boys through the portal to compete at the highest level. 
I love that. They continue to evolve and adapt and embrace what modern college football is. I also think it's worth noting, for Ole Miss, college football is shifting to where it is less important to win your conference to win a national championship. It used to be you pretty much have to win your conference, probably have to be a one-loss team at least in the SEC, maybe undefeated to make it to the college football playoff, and then you got to go make a run. Right now, not only is Nick Saban out of the picture in the SEC, but Ole Miss, if they win 10 ball games, they're in the dance. They can, they can miss going to Atlanta entirely and still make a run at this thing when it comes to winning national championships. It's more important to be hot at the right time, and I think that quite honestly favors Lane Kiffin and the way that his football team is built. When you talk about commitment and acquiring talent, I don't know how Ole Miss stacks up with the A&Ms of the world and the Alabamas of the world. I don't know that they have that level of commitment, but I would say the commitment to Lane Kiffin and giving him what he needs to be successful, checking a lot of boxes at this point. Because you don't sign the portal class that Lane Kiffin has signed over the course of his time in Oxford without some NIL resources. And also the way that they've championed Lane Kiffin to just be Lane Kiffin. Like the reason why I love Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss is because Lane Kiffin is not for everybody. And that's not throwing shade at Lane Kiffin. You know who else wasn't for everybody? Nick Saban and Kirby Smart. But they won, and so their school supported them and embraced them. I think Lane Kiffin, the way that he beats to his own drum, Ole Miss is just on board with it. And they're more on board with it because he's had some results here. I think Ole Miss is going to continue to gain steam in this expanded playoff era. So for me, Ole Miss is at number four in my projected rankings for the top five teams in the SEC over the course of the next three seasons. Now, here's where it gets a little bit murky. I think you quite honestly could make a case for any of these next three teams we're going to talk about to be the top team in the conference going forward. At number three, I got LSU. Again, it's a taste test, but for me, it's death, taxes, and Brian Kelly winning a whole lot of football games. Right, like he's coached, I believe, close to, if not more than 400 ball games as a head coach in college ball. He's won north of 70% of those. Okay, so he's going to win. Since he's been at LSU, the two years, two years, two 10 win seasons, one Heisman Trophy winner, two top 10 recruiting classes. And right now, at the time of us being live, they got the number one doggone class in 2025. Mic drop. So again, if, you, if you're making a case for LSU to be the top team over the course of the next three years, you got a lot of. I think juice behind that. If this were strictly a power ranking for this upcoming season, I'd have LSU at two. I think LSU at two makes a whole lot of sense. Now, they have three different coaches that have won national titles since 2000. That tells us loud and clear, the ingredients are right there for you to be successful at LSU. From fertile recruiting ground to the resources to the brand itself, you can win at LSU. Three different guys have done it since 2000. So LSU, without question, I think, has a chance to to make some real noise here over the course of the next three seasons. I said I'd have them at two when it came to power ranking. That's going off of what we know. Because again, this is a projection. So I'm not predicting LSU to finish second in the SEC. I'm saying power ranking for stability, I'd put LSU at two. Want to make sure we're all on the same page there. Now, when it comes to, and that's based on track record, based on resume, LSU has the second best resume in my mind of what teams have done in the SEC. That's the reason why we have Brian Kelly as our second best coach in college football right now. Now, at number two, I got the Texas Longhorns. And quite frankly, the reason why I don't have LSU higher on this projection ranking list and the reason why I have Texas at two ahead of them is because I truly think Steve Sarkeesian is just getting started. I think he's just getting started. I mean, what he's done at Texas since he's been there, it is such a difficult lift to culturally get Texas to where they are right now. Because when he took it over, that was the, the talking point, right? Hey, boosters, they got their hand in the cookie jar all the time. Too many cooks in the kitchen. You can't really just do your thing as a head coach. The culture, it's rotten. You got you to fix it. Steve Sarkeesian has now moved past the growing pain stage and into the, hey, we're going to win a lot of football games stage as they move into the SEC. Texas is at a place from a commitment level where they're all in. And Steve Sarkeesian, going back to that conversation around boosters, he's either, one, been able to win enough to where you're not probably having too many cooks in the kitchen because you trust the cook himself, which is Steve Sarkeesian, or he's managing those folks effectively enough to still not have it impact the on-field product. From a recruiting standpoint, I mean, they're killing it in the portal. Isaiah Bond, Amari Nyblack, Adonai Mitchell last season. Heck, a guy named Quinn Ewers, you got him through the portal as well, people forget. From the high school level, The last three years, 2022, number five class, 2023, number three class, 2024, the number six class, 
Yeah, I think they're just fine. I think Steve Sarkeesian, his personal journey and his time he spent with Nick Saban in Tuscaloosa, I think that provided a lot of clarity to what he wants to be as a head football coach, to how to win as a head football coach, perfecting his own process, and now they're just straight up executing it. And again, I think over the course of the next three years, by how they've recruited, by the way they are cooking and the momentum they have, I think they're just getting started for me. The number two team when it comes to my projection rankings within the SEC going forward. Now, a number one, we don't got to overthink it. We don't, we don't got to overthink this here, brother. It's Georgia. They have the best coach in the sport in college football, which is Kirby Smart. They are allergic to recruiting outside of the top three. The brand recruits itself now, too. Like, Georgia's at a point where I wholeheartedly believe kids want to come play at Georgia. And Georgia, yes, they still have to win some recruiting battles. There's no way around that. But for the most part, like, they're not having to pump up what they're going to be or try and sell this vision. Like, Georgia is what Georgia is, man. They've won two national titles the last three years. I think they had the best football team purely last year, if we're just going to be honest here. If they were healthy, I think Georgia probably would have won the national championship. And that's not throwing trade at Michigan. Maybe it would have been a close game. But I think Georgia, just from an overall roster standpoint, best team in college football the last three seasons. And so going back to my point here, you're not trying to pump up the brand. You're just showing kids what it is and saying, listen, you come to Georgia. We're going to compete. You're going to practice hard. But guess what? By doing those things, by going through our process, you're going to develop. And by developing as a football player and by buying into our culture, you're going to win a whole lot of football games, probably get some jewelry. It's going to be a good time. You want to come play for Georgia? And kids that buy into that do exactly what Kirby Smart says they're going to do. And so what I want to make sure we emphasize here, Kirby Smart and the team's competitive DNA that he's built year in and year out at Georgia is different now. It's a different competitive DNA. And they've built it by how they practice and by who they practice against. Like you got four and five stars starting out on the scout team, running against you know the, the ones where, where you're over there giving a look. You don't think that makes the ones better? You don't think that makes the, te- the guys on the scout team a little bit better? You don't think that raises the competitive temperature of the practice facility? I promise you it does. Other part of that is whenever you are practicing the way that George does, you have no choice but to become a little bit more mentally tough, a little bit more calloused. Like Bloody Tuesday, it's a real thing. Bloody Tuesday, for those of y'all that don't know in Athens, that is the most physical practice of the week for Georgia. You talk to Georgia players, they talk about two things, their DNA traits and how the games are easier because of how they practice. They say, practice is the hard part. We get to the game, we're like thankful to be on Saturday and just be able to play ball, hit another color. So all that's to say, I don't think that machine is stopping anytime soon. Commitment-wise, you have what you need if you're Kirby Smart. There's no questioning how much commitment you're getting from Georgia, how many yeses he's getting when you come to Kirby Smart. It's real. It's real. It's sustainable because we've seen under Kirby Smart, and I've said this a few times now, the personnel under him has changed multiple times from quarterback to coordinators to who you have on defense. Like we've seen them lose, regroup, rebuild, refill that production. It's a factory. It's an assembly line. And I don't think it's slowing down anytime soon. So Georgia, for me, is the number one team when it comes to our projection rankings for the SEC. Now, with that being said, there were a couple other teams that I considered here putting in this top five. Reasons why I couldn't do that, I'll explain. But this is my other teams that I consider putting this top five. Tennessee, the Josh Heupel effect. He recruits the quarterback position, I think, as well as anybody else in the country. You saw that flash year in 2022. I'm looking for a little bit more sustained success over the long term before I put them in that top five. But if we do this next year, I wouldn't be surprised if we put Tennessee into this conversation at all. A&M, similar thought process. I don't know what Mike Elko is going to be as a head coach at a and I'm waiting to see if they can really put it together. But the ingredients are there. The ingredients have really been there for a minute now, if we just want to be honest. But Mike Elko, the structure he brings, the talent they have, and the commitment they have in College Station to making their football team better, to making their football team one of the top teams in the country. Zero questions. I think it's as good as anybody else in America. Other team I talked about here that I probably could have thrown in the mix, Auburn. Uh, I, just, I believe in Hugh Freeze. We haven't seen enough yet on the field for me to feel good about putting them in the top five over the next three years. I believe in Hugh Freeze. He's going to attack the talent side of things from the portal to recruiting. They will win at Auburn to what degree and how soon, I don't know, but they're going to win at Auburn. I'll just say that. Also, Missouri, again, sustained success, but the care factor they have with people giving anonymous donations north of $60 million, keep an eye on Missouri. So, again, my top five when it comes to our our, – 
our projection rankings within the SEC. From five to one at number five, you got Alabama. No shade on Alabama. I'm waiting to see what Kalen DeBoer is as a recruiter in the SEC. He's done more with less. Can you do more with more and win at the highest level? I can't wait to see it. Bam at five. At number four, I got Ole Miss. They're all in on Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin, all he does is win and attack the portal. They're embracing modern college football. I think they'll be rewarded for that, like they have been previously, but they will be in the expanded playoff format over the course of the next three seasons. LSU at three, death taxes. Brian Kelly winning a whole lot of ball games. They're trending the right way without question. You could put them at two, but at two, I got Texas because I don't think Steve Sarkeesian is anywhere near his best as a coach just yet. I don't think Texas is their best under Steve Sarkeesian, so I'll put them at two. Georgia, number one in the country and in the SEC for me over the course of the next three seasons as it stands right now. Let's not overthink it. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.